Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again. Today I am Trace, this is episode 4 of 5 in our series on pornography. So far we've talked about how it affects your brain, how the porn industry works, and how pornography has pretty much been around as long as we have, so make sure you check out those episodes. But today, we're going to talk about how porn has advanced technology. Pornography, in a lot of ways, has pretty much driven innovation, or maybe if it's not the driver, it's definitely in the passenger seat. It's right there, at the forefront. I like this quote from an article on CNN.com. It's widely known, but it's seldom spoken truth in the technology world that whether there is a new content platform, the adult entertainment industry is one of the first to adopt it, if they didn't help create it in the first place. In his book, The Erotic Engine, How Pornography Has Powered Mass Communication, from Gutenberg to Google, author Patchen Bars says, quote, Creators and consumers of sexual content have been the driving force behind communications developments as diverse as streaming internet video and the concept of beta testing software, end quote. There's a whole bunch of technologies that pornography has either pushed into the mainstream, helped to build up in some way or another, or outright invented on their own. Patch and Bars discusses these in his book, so let's list a few of these. Going way back, you know, we're talking leaflets and books, which we mentioned earlier. Pornography became part of those very early on, hundreds of years ago, and not long after mass communication started. Once we were able to print things very easily, pornography added in to the things that we were printing. It wasn't just politics. It wasn't just religious texts. It was also some hot stuff. It just happened. But when it comes to technology, we're not necessarily thinking about ancient stuff. You know, we're not thinking about how the chisel was first used to chisel out some pornography on a wall. We're talking about, usually, modern technology. So things on the internet, things with televisions, things with video, right? When the internet first started coming about, some of the kids might not remember this, there were things called bulletin boards. And you could go on there, they were also called forums today, where there were communities of people that could buy and sell and trade and do all sorts of things. A lot of recipes were traded that way, but so was a lot of pornography. Early on, AOL had chat rooms that you could create where people were trading pornography on a dial-up connection. I mean, cable originally required a subscription, and subscription numbers were in part driven by the fact that you could watch pornography on cable. You couldn't watch that on broadcast television. Cable television had whole shows, and all they were for was a softcore sexual plot, maybe a subplot to the main one, but that's really why people tuned in. Though some, like Real Sex on HBO, didn't turn into the sex theater that these other ones turned into, and instead attempted to actually showcase real, literally, sex with real people. The VCR came about, and you were able to record things, but you were also able to mail tapes from one place to another. Most people were totally fine going out to see a movie, but pornography consumers would want to watch their stuff alone at home. So now you have this mail order system, not just magazines. You didn't have to go to an adult theater in a seedy part of town. You could buy a VCR, record your favorite TV show, and also get a mail order tape from your favorite pornographic manufacturer. They would pony up for this home viewing system just so they could, you know, stay at home and watch it. There is even considerations for closed captioning and subtitles related to pornography. Yeah, that's right. You heard it correctly. Now, when we got into the age of the internet, those bulletin boards eventually evolved, and they became ways for people to instantly communicate with each other, and they needed ways to start selling those subscriptions, similar to a cable model. Self-proclaimed geek with big breasts, Danny Ash, launched a commercial website early on on the internet, in the 1990s. By 2001, her company had 45 employees and an $8 million annual revenue from selling pornography. Eventually, that paved the way for PayPal, eBay, Amazon, and all sorts of other commercialization of the internet. There are still people who get uncomfortable about giving out their credit card numbers to strangers on the internet. By strangers, I mean Amazon. Imagine just giving it to Danny Ash for some reason. Somebody had to make people get used to doing that, and in part, Porn was a way to do that. Webcams are a big part of the porn industry today, but in 1996, a show called Jenny Cam debuted. A 19-year-old college girl in Pennsylvania bought a webcam at her college store and turned it on, and it updated her website with a still image of her in her dorm room every 15 minutes. Eventually, she got a better website, 
It updated every few minutes. And it ended up completely changing her life. I mean, she became famous on the internet because of this webcam, and people did occasionally see things that were more erotic. For example, if she brought a boy back to her college dorm room, or when she slept with her roommate's fiance. Then, every second, things would get updated eventually. That's when you get to online video. We have multiple images updating every second. It's not that different from a webcam in 1996. It's just faster updating. Then we have live sex shows. We've got FaceTime. We've got Snapchat. <laughs> Don't even get me started on how Snapchat's story is going to be told from when it got started. Today, businesses conduct entire meetings and conference calls using technologies that originally were used because people wanted to watch other people get naked. Digital cameras also took that away from the computer. You could have this battery-powered camera that you could take anywhere that you didn't have to take out and get developed. Polaroids were a great example of how pornography started to be personalized and didn't have to go to a lab and develop those photos. But analysts generally agree that porn photographers and videographers didn't really like having to take their film to those labs, so they put extra efforts into technologies like digital cameras that didn't require you to do that. You could just do it right at home with your personal computer. Eventually, those videos were just streaming across the net. In 1994, a Dutch porn company, Red Light District, developed the very first workable internet-based video streaming system. Without porn, there would probably be no YouTube today because nobody would have pushed that technology forward. So if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks, porn. If you're listening on iTunes, also thanks, porn. <laughs> on top of that, to get these downloads to you, you need bandwidth. You need to make the internet faster. Dial-up can only give you so many frames of porn per second. So you need a demand for better bandwidth because of the demand for sexual content. People were improving their routers, their switches, their software, their relays, and internet infrastructure, backbones, and things to send files back and forth. Many of those files were pornography. Technology isn't invented necessarily to facilitate pornography. But pornography is one of its early uses. If you've ever been on a social network early on, a software program you can get on your phone or go onto a website with, people are using it for pornography right away, day one, all the time. There are even new technologies that pornography didn't invent necessarily, but is very much trying to become an early adopter of, like virtual reality. At this stage, virtual reality porn is mostly hype. Not a lot of people have virtual reality units yet, and it doesn't really exist out there in the wild as often as their regular streaming video porn. But companies like Oculus Rift and others, they're starting to offer powerful and immersive new formats for this adult entertainment. According to TechCrunch, these breakthrough devices and the software that powers them has a basic presence, and that's already been achieved. With well-produced VR porn, even this rudimentary presence creates a dramatically more intense erotic experience. Now imagine as people start to share and spread that erotic experience to others, it's going to dwarf erotica and video streaming and webcamming and the ways that each new technology has pushed it forward every time. On top of that, there are technologies like teledildonics, which is a sex toy that connects to a computer network. From across the internet, a performer can affect your sexuality. Personal sex devices have been around for a long time, since the creation of the dildo and probably before, but haptic technology, tiny vibrations that are created using very sensitive equipment connected to your computer, can create all sorts of experiences for both men and women. And sex robots aren't that far off either. Let's be honest. Orgasms are good for the body, for the mind, and for our intimacy, and sex dolls have already been around for generations. They've only gotten more lifelike, and how far do you think we really are from adding robotics into that system? Rest assured, as soon as androids show up, someone's going to try and stick it in there. Or, you know, other way around, get stuck in. But it's interesting to say it that way, I guess, because we always assume that porn is for men. Is there truth to that? Or what about women's role in porn? Tomorrow we're going to talk about that and what porn has to do with women. Please watch more Test Tube Plus. You can subscribe so that you don't miss one of our episodes ever. You can also talk to me over on Twitter. I'm at Trace Dominguez. And let me know what you think about technologies related to this topic. You can tell us about it down in the comments. And thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow on Test Tube Plus.